turn the panel on it. What did you say? I didn't hear you. Praise God. Wells, here we are. Another Thursday night. Uh, give it a few minutes for everyone to get on. Praise God. Good evening, everyone. I'm, I'm thankful tonight for the Lord and His goodness to us. Uh, we'll give you a report on Brother Bud and Nacogdoches. He's doing fine. Actually, it seems like he's about over. It's like he just had a small case of the flu. Uh, although he did test positive for coronavirus. So, and some others in his church did too, but uh, I think they're all doing fine, so we're thankful for that. Uh, brother Zachary in the Dominican Republic, good to see you, brother. <coughs> um, I don't know that I have anything else really to report. I do want to mention I appreciate all the brethren that were uh, at our work day last Saturday for the church. We got a lot done and we're having another work day. I just want to announce that this Saturday at 8 o'clock. And uh, we're still preparing the dining room to put down a new tile in the flooring and uh, and several other things that need to be done. So uh, appreciate in advance everyone that can come out and help us out and, and all uh, we generally just work about a half a day. And uh, so, uh, God bless you all. It's a good good uh, time to, to um, this is an interesting time that we're living in. I, I still feel that, you know, the Lord's getting us ready in uh, preparing for the close of the, Gentile age. Uh, I do feel like we've got some time, and uh, but I, you know, it's in my lifetime. It just seems so unreal that what all is going on in the world, and particularly in the in the United States of America, could be uh, taking place. Uh, the way that it is. Uh, anyway, so <clears throat> it, uh, sometimes you don't hardly want to admit it. You know, you, you want to think, well, things are going to get all right. But, but uh, of course, this coronavirus deal is, uh, is almost devastated the whole world. It it um, really doesn't seem like it's as serious as it's been made out to be. However, if we hadn't took the measures we'd taken, or I should say, uh, if our medical profession, profession and uh, our civil power leaders hadn't took the measures that they've taken, it possibly could have been a lot worse than it is. One thing is we just won't know because you know, decision, decisions had to be made and we followed those decisions and you know, but I do feel like we will get beyond this. Uh, but it's gonna change things and and um, so I don't know this evening I'm contemplating on you know, if I wanna pursue that avenue, you know. I have even considered, uh, I've considered going through, using y'all as a sounding board, going through the book of Revelations, you know, the chapter at a time, 
just uh, seems like every time I go through it, I pick up something new myself. And, um, and I know it's something that I'm, I'm trying to put in uh, audible and, and printable form in the near, near future. I hope I get it done. Anyway, uh, I do want to read this scripture in Psalms 1. Just, it's just uplifting to me. Uh, let me scoot this back just a little bit so that it won't cut my head off. Psalms 1 verse 1 says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delights in the law of the Lord, and his, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but or like the chaff, which the wind driveth away, therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So <clears throat> he does start off here talking about the man that walks not, in the counsel of the ungodly. See, some, the ungodly just walking in their own will. They're just, you know, how, what did the, the scripture relating to the devil in several places said he's going about seeking whom he may devour or he's going up and down in the earth. That's the way wickedness, wickedness in man is what that's talking about. Uh, ungodly men are just, they're just going up and down in the earth. They don't have any, they don't set, have any purpose uh, outside of temporal purpose just to, you know, be successful in this life or, but they're not gaining any spiritual wisdom or any contact with their creator and finding his purpose for the whole creation. It's like, you know, this, I'm in this for me and for what I can get out of it, but it's just a mere, you know, 75 years or 80 years or whatever, however, you can live to be a hundred. Um, but then he mentioned, nor stand this in the way of sinners. See, when a person sins knowingly. See, an ungodly person just, they're just like beasts. They're just like animals. I mean, I'm sorry to put it that way, but they're just simply uh, doing uh, according to their own uh, lust and their own, I'll just say the, their nature. I've got, I've got a little dog that <clears throat> He's so driven by his nature. He can't change. He can't, there's, not, there's not anything you can do to get him to change. I mean, you can make him mind you, but he's going to do what he wants to do. I mean, uh, yeah, he loves to eat ice. And he'll come, if, I, if, I, if he wants ice and I don't, have a, I don't even have a drink, a water, I normally I have a glass of water with ice in it. I like to eat ice. He likes to eat ice. I made the mistake of giving him ice one day and he liked it and kept coming back more. Now, he'll when I sit down in my chair, he'll come up to my chair and he'll look, he'll look over at my end table and he'll look at me like, where's the ice? He'll look back at me. And then, you know, he'll just sit there and just stare at me. And I know, you know, he can't talk, but I know what he's saying. He's saying, Where's the ice? We, we need to go get us some ice. <laughs> and, uh, but when I do get a drink, I mean, here he comes, you know, 
and and he's sitting right there at the chair, and he's every time I take every every time I take a sip of water, he hears that wise rattling. He wants he he jumps up and his ears perk up, and of course I'll get him. I'll get a a, a cube of ice out and give it to him. Of course this, these are little cubes, and um, but just everything about him. It's just I mean it's just the way these little animals are. They're just driven by their nature. And they do what, you know, they're, they're even though uh, my wife and I have raised dogs a long time and, and uh, she's, she's good to train dogs. And, but from time to time, they'll do something and she'll say they're still just dogs. <laughs> and uh, it's, they're driven by their nature. And uh, humans, people that have no contact with God are driven by their nature. And it's interesting because um, one of the things that I've learned in breeding animals over many years is I've learned about genetics, at least some. I'm, I'm not a genetic specialist or geneticist, you know, if that's what you call it, but but um, what I have learned is, is that I tell people all the time that when there's a mating of a man or, and a woman or a dog and a, a, male, a male dog, any, any species, male to female, and they produce offspring, I didn't know this for many years, but they, um, they never, almost never produce I'm talking about over 99% of the time, they do not produce directly from each other. They're on direct ge genetics, but it's normally every time there's a mating, there's a different matchup in a gene pool. And <clears throat> the, like one mating, it could be a mating with a, uh, on the male side, we'll just hypothetically say, the matchup in this mating was to his great great grandmother, and then on the female side, maybe it was the great, just the grandfather. Next mating may be a total different matchup, and unless you know the genetics of each one of those in the gene pool and what their ancestry is, then you you don't know what you're going to produce. Uh, of course, you, you, if you take a long, someone that's been, been breeding animals for many, many years and they do it genetic, in other words, they, they're watching and trying to produce the best traits that they can produce and breed away from undesirable traits, undesirable health issues, undesirable temperaments, undesirable uh, ability to... Uh, have a higher in intelligence, uh, confirmation, uh, everything. You you just keep breeding the better, the best to the best, and uh, and then you have to what is called line breeding, which is you breed back into the same genetic pool, not inbreeding, not where you're breeding son to mother, father to daughter, brother to sister, but you're breeding further away from that. Uh, most cases, three to five generations, but you're, you're picking up the same traits out of that genetic pool. In humans, it's why humans don't, don't produce that way. Not, they don't produce trying to develop the, uh, proper gen genetics, uh, uh, for an example here, breeders of cattle that are registered cattle breeders and they breed for genetics, that is why we have the quality meat that we have in America. If they just bred cows to cows and never did, weren't trying to improve on all of the things that produces good meat, good beef, then we just have mediocre beef and that's what they have in most third third world countries. But in America where you've got your your uh, elite um, breeders of, of registered stock, they just keep breeding 
and developing the, the traits to produce the best beef that can be produced. And then what they do is, is they take the best of the best and they call the rest, which a lot of times is very, maybe just a small difference. And they sell those bulls and even some of the heifers, they'll sell them to commercial cattlemen who sells for beef. And that those bulls from those outstanding registered breeders is what's producing out of commercial cattle, the better beef. And that's why we have the beef we have today. I was gonna say in humans, you know, you're a first child may be a, a, a tall, lanky, red-headed, freckle-faced boy. A second child may be a short, stocky built, olive complected girl or boy, either one. And but they're not they're not alike because they're they're they matched up different in the genetics, in the gene. Well, in humans, you know, I said all of that to say this, that the ungodly, you know, uh what does it say in the let me let me just read this many of you listening already know that some of these scriptures but there's people that don't and those you know i don't want to leave them out so let me read you here in the third chapter of, of the book of ecclesiastes where it says uh Here's what he said in the 18th verse of Ecclesiastes 3. He said, I said in mine heart concerning the estate of the sons of men that God might manifest them and that they might see that they themselves are beasts. For that which befalleth a beast, even one thing befalleth them. As one dies, so dieth the other. Yea, they all have one breast, so that a man hath no preeminence above a beast, for all is vanity. Let me, let me, this is Brother Green from the Dominican Republic. Hello, it's Brother Elias. Yes, sir, Brother Smith, you, you don't teach your flyer. I'm on Facebook right now on a Bible study. So, if you get on my page... Well, go to my regular page. I believe that's where it is. Just go to my regular page. I'm on Facebook. Okay. That's Pastor Elias in the Dominican Republic. And I, I'm not sure, but I don't think I'm on the First Gospel Church Pastor Smith page. For some reason I could not, I couldn't get on live. And so I just, I think I went to my regular page and got on. But anyway, I'm glad those of you that found me, uh, I guess I'm maybe, maybe all this technology, uh, I've always loved technology, uh, but it may be passing me up some. Anyway, here it says one, as one dies, so dieth the other. They have all have one breath and the man hath no preeminence, that a man hath no preeminence above a beast. For all is vanity, all go unto one place, all are of the dust and all turn to dust again. Well, what he's saying here, he's saying, if God doesn't manifest himself, uh, verse 18, I said in my heart concerning the state of the sons of men that God might manifest them, that they might see that they, the, the, they themselves are beasts. We know that man has to be born again. Man is born of Adam, we're born of a fallen nature and, and we cannot perfect that nature. Now, like I was telling you about raising dogs, you can take a dog and train it. You can train a dog to do just about anything you want it to do. I raise standard poodles and, and that's the big standard poodle. I've got them that will, they will point birds, they'll retrieve birds, they make good uh, duck hunters. I've got several duck hunters that have them. Other kind of dove, you know, as far as retrievers are concerned, but I've got some that do more than that with them. I've got one man that has a cattle ranch that told me, there, brother Cipriano, you did get on. Praise God. He found us. Anyway, so I've got this one cattle rancher, and he's a, 
he he bought one of my dogs and that and he talked to me one day. He said, this dog is the best cow dog I've ever owned. I said, really? He said, yes, this dog can pin a cow better than any dog I've ever, it, it works cattle. It, it knows how to herd cattle, put them, pin them wherever I want to pin them. I said, how did you teach her how to do that? He said, I didn't. He said, I just took her in the truck with me every day. And when I got out of the truck, she got out of the truck. And after a while, she just figured out what I was doing. She just went to helping me do it. She saw that I was gathering cattle up out of one pasture, putting them in another pasture, putting them in a corral. He said, she just started running along behind them, barking at them, making them do what I was wanting them to do. He said, she she just learned it on her own. She just by being around me and watching what I was doing. That you can train a dog, you can train a person. Did you know that? See, that's what the law did. The law, the law of Moses. That's what God did. He, he began to deal with a, a man with a fallen nature and began to cause man to see. See, man has enough intelligence, intellect, that God could deal with man and cause him to see in the law what was righteous and what wasn't righteous. If a man was so inclined to really, really seek God out and really want to know, you know, what is, what is God trying to tell us? And they would learn through the law, you know, the, the truth of righteousness and what many of those rituals, I call them rituals, but they were, they were religious rites that God had them do as far as the way they dressed, the food that they ate, the dietary laws God put them on, even so much as the Sabbath, you know, that there was a day they were not to do any kind of, excuse me, any kind of work. Amazing, but uh, God wanted them to know there, there's something that I'm wanting you to get to where you are not doing any of your labors. You're not doing your will, you're resting, from doing your will and things that need to be done that you need to do naturally. I'm gonna make you do some resting because I want you to understand, and and there's a lot of people who doesn't understand that. They think still, you know, that there needs to be a particular day as a Sabbath. You know, the Sabbath was on a Saturday. There's, you know, the seventh day Sabbath. They still, they, they still are holding to that because it was so emphatic in the Old Testament. But uh, if we're not careful, we miss, we'll miss understanding that what God was really working on was that we actually enter into a time where we cease from our labors. Let me, I'm going to read some more here, but let me give you a scripture in Revelations 14. I think this is an, I think this is a, an emphatic scripture that is very important scripture because let me read it to you in the 14th chapter of the book of revelations in the 13th verse this is one verse before john looked and behold a white cloud one that sat upon it like the son of man having a uh, on his head a golden crown and sharp sickle in his hand and he's reaped the earth with it this is talking about the reaping and the harvest of the end of the Gentile world. And the verse right before that, uh, you'd have to pick up the sixth, chat, the sixth verse all the way down to this 13th verse to understand that there, this is talking about a restored ministry when the church is restored. And it's going to have three messages. One, fear God and give him glory. Two, two, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. God's going to judge Babylon. And there's going to be a ministry that God will use to bring that judgment upon Babylon. Uh, but first, we're going to have to develop a greater fear and a greater awe and a greater awareness of God and what he's wanting to do in our lives. Not that we don't know now to a great extent, but it's going to get greater. 
when God manifests himself fully. And it's not going to be saints of God. It's not going to be so that you'll be able to see God do great miracles. No, the, the, the great miracles just comes, it comes with the power and demonstration of God's full manifestation. And, and it's, it's, that, that's an amazing, it's gonna be an amazing time. The Gentiles have never seen, I'm talking about the Gentiles since the falling away of the church, have never seen an operation of God like this. That, and what is coming, it's coming. Anyway, 13th verse here, here's what it says. Um, I didn't tell you the third part. First, fear God and give him glory. I could talk on fearing God for quite a while here. If I could finish the night up next week too, or longer, talking about having the proper fear of God. And that's not just talking about being afraid of him, but that is part of it. You need to be afraid uh, of God's judgment. You know, we we do not want to enter into God's judgment that is a a uh, destructive judgment. There is a destructive judgment of God. There, it's it's called eternal judgment in the Bible. It does two things. If you're righteous, it'll eternally judge you worthy of everlasting life. If you're not and you're ungodly, it'll judge you eternally unworthy and God's destruction and his wrath will come on you. You, you may die like the scripture said in First Psalms that you won't stand in judgment. That just doesn't, you, you don't just want to take that all the way down to the end and say you're not even going to come up in resurrection for a judgment if you're ungodly. Well, let me tell you about the ungodly today. If an ungodly person comes in your church They'll walk in your church and they'll walk right out of it and they won't be effective. They might, to some extent, depends on whether or not God has any measure in them that he can deal with them. If he can convict them while they're there, if he can hear an anointed word of God, if he can feel the spirit of God in the song service or someone's testimony, however God can deal with them. But so many ungodly people walk in and walk out because they won't stand. If you start preaching the word of God, it will judge you. There's judgment in the word of God. It'll bring some judgment, conviction on you. And an ungodly person won't stand for that. That's what that means. They won't stand in judgment. And they'll continue not to stand in judgment until they find themselves unworthy and go into the grave unworthy to even rise, rise for a judgment. See, there will be a, a, a judgment after the thousand years that will judge the unjust. And those people, but the ungodly, now an unjust person is, a, is one of God's children, but an ungodly person is a person that is without God. They, they've, never, they've never known God, They're not in the measure of repentance. They've never known God in any measure. And, and therefore, they've turned God down in every way that if God was able to deal with them at any time, if they remained ungodly. But let's read this verse in uh, Revelation 14. 13th verse says, and I heard a voice. Oh, I wanted to say before I get there, I never have got to it, that Babylon is fallen is the second message of the restored church ministry. It will begin just like the early church did. You remember what Jesus said? It's a second trumpet. Second trumpet, there was a mountain that was cast into the sea. Uh, and Jesus told his disciples, said, if you got the the uh, faith is a grain of a mustard seed. Thou shalt say unto this mountain, be thou plucked up and be cast into the sea. He was talking about religion. Religion in the Bible prophetically uh, is mountains. Mountains is a rise in the earth. It's a higher place. It, it's, it's a high place of influence. Religion is an influence on people's lives. And so that that Though that mountain, there's several mountains today of religion in the world. And uh, so uh, Babylon 
you know, that was, that was in their day, in the end of the Jewish world, that was a mountain. Judaism was a mountain of influence. And you know what the apostles did? They cast it into the sea. They plucked up every influential ideology that was planted by Judaism in the people's minds, and they removed that from their minds, and they no longer, that influence had no more influence over because they understood the truth of God's word instead of trying to trying to serve a ritual and serve a, and and just be trained to make your nature do what it what what uh, it's going to do or you know what what it may not want to do but what it's been trained to do but you see true righteousness is when you've been born again of God's nature now the mind, the, your mind is a vehicle. It is a vehicle for both those natures. See, your mind, when you was a, when you when you was born a child, you're just a few days and full of trouble because that fallen nature is in you, and you're just going to do what. Now something else has an effect on you besides just the genetics I was talking about earlier, but it also what has an effect on you is environment, your environment, where you came from, the social uh, 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 function of the people that you're around, the environment you come out of. You, you will be influenced by others who are in that same type of environment. Um, but you have a nature that that leans towards, uh, you know, following the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's why you must be born again. Now, once you're born again, you've got the nature that Jesus had. The, the that's of the the spirit of the Father. You're born again of God's nature. But that nature doesn't have a mind. And it has no vehicle where that may, that nature can uh, develop a behavior, a righteous behavior, unless uh, the mind is renewed. That's why Paul said, "Be you renewed in the spirit of your mind." To be renewed means you you know there's something there's there's something that happened to what was new, and now. It's going to have to be redone, reworked, renewed. And, and uh, <clears throat> that's what has to happen to your mind. In my mind, after we're born again, we have to begin to gain knowledge of the Lord, his salvation plan, what his purpose is. And his, then the righteousness of God has to begin to develop in us. It, it comes into our mind. When the Bible talks about us getting the Father's name written in our foreheads, that's that. See, the, the mark of the beast is going to get written in the foreheads of everyone that doesn't come to God and come to God's purpose and to God's people that He's developing. And what He's doing is He's putting in our thinking righteous knowledge, righteous understanding develops into righteous wisdom. You keep divide, you keep renewing your mind in righteousness, and that happens by an anointing. See, it's not just the words of God, but the letter kill it, but the spirit maketh alive. See, just the word, you can read this all you want to, and theologians have done it for years, and it didn't do anything. It just made them trained there's many people in religion that are trained just like people on the law was trained. They're trained to do righteous knowing that they're supposed to be righteous. And, uh, but you're not really righteous. You just, you just train the flesh to do what's right. And you get a measure of God that, that in repentance, that's, there's a certain amount of pleasing in it, but almost everyone knows there's something missing. And, and it, it's, we, we're needing what the early church had. People ask me all the time, well, what, are we, what do we not have today? What do we need that we don't have? 
Well, we don't have what the early church had. Let's just read the New Testament together and I'll show you several things in God's full manifestation and power and demonstration of the Spirit that we don't have. We don't have the things that will cause uh, you to develop this nature into its fullness. That's We're lacking some areas right there. And uh, so, uh, but this scripture here, besides Babylon's fallen, the next thing is do not take the mark of the beast or his image, the mark of his image. See, that's one of the first times that it talks about men taking a mark of the, not just the beast, but the, but the image of the beast. See, because that, that hadn't been set, wasn't set up until the 13th chapter of the book of Revelation. So now it's added in. Now, you know, the beast has been going on even in the Gentile world a long time, if you know what the beast is. But then the image of the beast, that the two-horned beast is going to make an image to the beast and give power to that image. And uh, so uh, there's the three messages. Fear God, give him glory. Babylon's fallen. It, it's going to take a ministry down here that's going to have to cast a mountain into the sea, remove the influence of religious ideology from God's people and begin to develop them in uh, the uh, true righteousness development of that of, of the renewing of the mind that will begin to line up with that new nature that they've been born of. Then the message is going to be dealing with people not to take the mark of the beast, to identify what it is and get people out of those systems and get them into the body of Christ and help them develop the true righteousness of God and help finish making up the remainder of the bride which brings us to this 13th verse. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. That's not talking about being blessed because you died and was put into a grave. It's talking about ceasing from your own labor, entering into the Sabbath, entering into the rest of God, getting to a place that you're no longer doing your will. See, it's not that God just wants you to do your will. He don't want you to have a will. It's talking about not doing the will of the flesh or that Adamic nature. He wants you to do your righteous will that's developed in that born again nature of God that's developed into you as an individual righteous workmanship of God. Every one of us has got our own fingerprint. Every one of us has got our own iris of our eyes that's different from anyone else's. And every one of us is born again of a different individualistic nature of God. We're his offspring. We are from the best genetics, the best gene pool that there is. It doesn't get any better. There's nothing any more pure. There's nothing any more righteous. We've been born of that nature, but our mind, remember, is the vehicle. That mind has to be trained up, and when it learns the righteousness of God and it corresponds to that nature and the spirit of God that's helping develop that righteousness in us where it's not a ritual but it's actual characteristic developed through the mind that lines up with this born again nature of God it's true righteousness it's true holiness and blessed are they that die in the Lord from henceforth. See, there wouldn't be any reason to be blessed to just die 
if you was God's child, you'd be blessed any time you die if you're God's child. But there's a, there is a time that it's more blessed that we've got an ability to die out to the Adamic nature and cease from our labors. And our works will follow us. The righteous works that's been developed in us, that will follow. Uh, so I just wanted to mention, I'm just mentioning that because uh, blessed are they, I'm going back to Psalms now, the first chapter, blessed are they that walk not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners. See, that's a child of God. He that doeth, he that knoweth to do right, doeth it not to him is sin. And so, uh, when you're, uh, when you when you decide, and you know to do right, you decide to do wrong. You've made a stand. You've made a stand. You've stood against righteousness, and you've stood for evil. And so there's a, you stand now. You're not just walking in the way of the flesh, but now, you, now you've known to do right and you've made a stand against right, against righteousness. You're standing in the way of sinners. And nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. See, there's three different categories of people here. And uh, factors four, it's talking about you. They're ungodly. You're talking about a just or righteous person that that he starts off talking about. This is blessed man. He doesn't walk in the way of the ungodly. He won't stand in the way of sinners. Neither will he sit in the seat of the scornful. Well, the seat of the scornful is a that is a that is a righteous self-righteous person that's always scorning, always looking down on others, always having, a, you know, a pride about their religious ideology or, you know, maybe they, you know, you, let's just take someone that, uh, that has all these laws for themselves. See, it's necessary when you come to God, it's necessary for you to, to uh, have commandments to hold the flesh down long enough until your mind can begin to grasp the things of God or the flesh will, will uh, rob you of that. Remember what Jesus taught about the parable of a sower, how that... Uh, you know, finally, he talked about the thorns, the thorny ground, that uh, the thorny ground will choke out the things of God. Uh, you know, I, I, I was raised on a farm, so I, I understand that. I've, I also had cattle in my life. I had a farm, and, and uh, so I planted all kinds of grass, and I've had all kinds of weeds and and uh, uh, thistles and everything else. There's one thing I like, never got rid of is thistles out of my pastures. And uh, uh, because they would bloom out and then the, the wind would blow and the blooms would come off and it, every one of them had a little seed in them and they'd go out and plant it here. They'd come up the next year and you're on your, on your pasture. It's so hard to get rid of them. Uh, but that's what will happen is when God starts blessing you and you start, you know, most people, most people that come to God are in pretty, in, in pretty much in need. You know, they're, they're, they're at a place in life that they need, they need they're at a, a crossroads and they need help and they realize they need help from God. Most, most people have been influenced in a godly way somehow. Family, mother, grandma, aunt and uncle, somebody that, you know, maybe they was raised in church and then they got away from God. And then, you know, they had to, you know, finally make their way back to God. Like the parable of the uh, prodigal son, you know, he, he wound up in the hog pen eating with hogs and finally come to his senses and said, my Lord said, the servants in my daddy's house got it better than his. said, maybe I can just go home and maybe daddy let me be a servant in his house. You know, he left 
where he could have been the heir to the whole thing, but now he's just hoping he can be a servant. Well, people get in a condition where they feel like, you know, uh, I need God again in my life. And they'll come to God, but then as they begin to do good, God begins to bless them because of their faith and their obedience, their servitude. And God begins to bless them, and God keeps blessing them. And before long, you know, first they start off, you know, they got all this wayside soil, you know, that, that it's hard to get them established. But once they get established, then uh, they, you know, the seed of the Word of God begins to develop in their life. Uh, but then here in a little while, these storms, the thorny ground, uh, the cares of this world, you get so blessed of God, you get interested in all of the things that's in this world. And uh, you get your mind off of and focus off of God and his purpose. Get your purpose back on it. You see, you're wrestling with that vehicle of your mind. Which, what are you going to, you know, the flesh likes, you know, I've had people tell me my flesh is rising when they see something they like, you know. And, uh, and it's a process that we go through. And uh, so we do have to get to a place, you know, to where, uh, we give over to the to the this nature of Christ, this this born again nature of right, this righteous nature. That uh, uh, we die out. There is a death that takes place. You have to die out to that Adamic nature. But eventually, as this mind developed, righteous mind lines up with this new nature. It it. Uh, it <clears throat> it doesn't it doesn't line up with the old Adamic nature anymore, and it just won't do the things that feed the flesh. And before long, the flesh has no vehicle to behave or manifest itself. And finally, the new man, the new creation, the new uh, righteous man of God is developing. And that's what Peter said. After you, you know, after you settled. See, you got to get settled in serving God. It takes time to get settled. Some people can't stand to get settled. It's because there's a battle. There's a bigger battle in the very beginning than there is. Um, you'll go quite a ways. Once you win that first battle, it's pretty much smooth sailing. That first battle to get out of the world, get away from all the worldly influence and everything, and finally get settled, then I'm going to serve God. I'm staying with the people of God. Then strengthen. The word of God will finally strengthen you and you'll gain enough strength to maintain following after God and the things of God. Let me read you this scripture in, in uh, Psalms 119. Psalms 119, beautiful chapter. We all know on this psalm in the Bible. But I love, let's just start in the first verse here. I'm just going to read three or four verses. It said, blessed, is, blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. See, not just partially, but you give your whole self over to seeking God. You want what God has more than you want what man has to offer. They also do no iniquity. You want to know what iniquity is? They walk in his ways. Think about that a minute. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. You walk in your way and you're committing iniquity. Iniquity is sin. It's evil. It's, it's the wicked man. It's the fallen nature of Adam. It's self. It's selfishness. It's giving over to the flesh, doing your own thing. 
if you get to a place you do no iniquity, it's when you're walking in his ways. So we have to learn of him, learn how to walk him. And so uh, to sit in the seat of the scornful, that's in any developed church. Those are saints that they think they're better than anybody else. Now let me just tell you something. You are, you have labored, you have worked, you have been blessed of God more than people that maybe are just starting out or, you know, if you're an elder or you're an example, well, that's what examples are. They've been blessed of God. They have more, uh, they, they are more of an example, but, but they recognize that that came to them from God that God had enough mercy on them to save them. They realized that I didn't, I didn't have enough. There was nothing in me that caused me to be better than anybody else that caused me to come and be saved. And here I am in the church and here's all these people that aren't saved or the just babies in church and look how much better I'm doing than them. No, a righteous person realizes with humility that it's just by the grace of God that I'm here that God was able to get a hold of me. God was able to deal with me. God was able to his mercy and his grace. No man cometh unto me except my father draws him, the Bible says. See, God, if God's got, if there's something in you, God can get a hold of. I don't care if it's a dream, it's a spirit, a song, anointed word of God. If God can touch you and you can respond to it, it's God wooing, set my father drawing. See, God draws you. He, there's something that you that influenced you. God did it through somebody, a godly influence of some measure that got a hold of you and, and had an effect and an influence on you. You responded to it. But you gotta maintain the humility of knowing that <laughs> Remember they get, you, you remember the person that come in with the 11th hour got the same penny, don't you? There's people that's going to come in in the end of this and they're going to get eternal life. They're going to get everlasting life just like you and I. You might say, well, I've been working here all my life. I've been faithful in the house of God. Here's this ungodly this snake that comes in here and he ain't been here five years. He comes in, yeah, he gets saved, but you know, I've been on the job all this time. And God blesses him. In fact, of business, God may, God may. I've seen people come in and pass other people up. You know, I remember Brother Clyde Patton telling us one time and at the campground, he said, when I first came into the body, I was a butcher. Me and my brother were butchers. And he said, Brother Souders would put us down below the hill. People would donate cattle beef uh, so that it, they could be so it feed the people he said he put us down there and we'd have to butcher cattle cut up meat and get it prepared for, to take up on the hill in the dining room to cook and he said I'd be down there cutting meat and I'd be thinking my god I'd give up my everything just to be here for this 10 day meeting at the campground and where am I at down here in a cow pen you know, and I'm cutting up meat, cutting up beef, preparing for the people of God. He said, Brother Souders evidently picked up on my spirit and knew that I was, I was, uh, you know, that was like a burr under my saddle. That was, I was, you know, wrestling with that. He said, one day he walked up to me, put his hand on my shoulder and he said, Brother Clyde, he said, if you'll, if you'll take this right and serve God's people, he said, God, God won't forget you. God will remember it. He said, after he talked on me, he said, that just done something for him. He said, I began to think on it. I began to get my spirit right and thankful for God that I could, I could be a part, whatever little part it was. I'm just going to be faithful, do what I'm asked to do. He said, I got happy about that. 
He said, you know, I don't know how long, but it wasn't too long that somebody else took that job and they sent me up on the hill to sit with the ministers. He said, when I got up there, he said, it just seemed like God stuck a funnel in my brain. And he said, people had been around for 40 years, just sitting around for 40 years. He said, I was getting it and they weren't getting, they didn't have it. He said, God, he said, it just means so much for us to keep the humility. He said, Brother Saunders had to help me. I don't know where I'd be. But he said, God, just begin to help me. And that's, that, that's so true. You know, it doesn't make any difference whether you come in the first hour, the 11th hour, whatever hour you come in. You are going to get things, the experience of it, the, uh, the workings of it through experience teaching us the patience while God is, is working in our lives. It's, it'll go with you throughout eternity. Throughout e every, you know, I keep saying eternity. I know eternal means don't ever have a beginning. <laughs> you know, we're going into an everlasting world. It's going to last forever. We had a beginning. God's the one that's eternal. He's the eternal God. Even Jesus had a beginning. Oh, God. What a savior we're serving. What a, what a life. This seat of the scornful. I don't want to be there. I don't want to be someone that might think that I'm so high and mighty and that I scorn others. I think I'm better than they. I, I go around judging other people. You can't judge another man's servant, <clears throat> Paul said. This, these are God's people. You know, I mean, I I know what that means is we cannot ultimately. I, I ultimately don't know what's in in the saints' minds that I have, that I'm 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 looking over and pastoring their lives. I don't know where they all together came from. I don't know everything about their whole life. God does. He knows how He's developed them. He He may be. They may be a lot further than some of them than what I think they are because I don't know where all they came from. And so, you know, they're God's children. We have to leave some things in the hand of the Lord. I've had people ask me, did, did Ananias and Sapphira, were they, were they uh, judged eternally unworthy? I said, I can't tell you that. Only God knows that. Did God just use them as an example like he did Uzzah just for staying in the ark? He reached up, tried to help. But see, it had to make an example to, to there's certain things that God had to hold to. And uh, so we had to leave some things in God's hands. Who's going to be, who's going to resurrect? That certainly were unjust, looks like to me. But I can't, I can't eternally, I can't judge them and say they'll never have, a, they don't have any hope. That's up, up to God. I just know one thing, I don't want to, I don't want to be someone that no one knows whether or not I made it or not, that I didn't live the life. I'd like for God to have enough influence in my life that I'd serve him <clears throat> faithfully to the end. All right, God bless your hearts. Uh, I'm just about out of time. I could I could keep talking. I promise you that. Uh, I, I didn't have a thing to say when it started tonight. <laughs> that happens to me a lot of times. I just start in and and uh, maybe get a thought, and the Lord, uh, you know, will will bless me with a thought, and uh, then from there we can. We can talk a little bit. So uh, I'm thankful tonight. I appreciate every one of you. I appreciate the Lord <clears throat> working in our lives. Let me read you this scripture in James, the first chapter. It says, my brother, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. <laughs> How many of y'all happy about that? 
knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, ask him, uh, let him ask God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it'll be given to him. So <clears throat> just remember to have patience, let it have its perfect work in your life. Uh, experience, you know, is going to work in your life. It's going to develop uh, a patience in you that's going to help you achieve. It's going to help God achieve what, what he's called you to be. God bless your hearts. Pray for us. We'll pray for you. I appreciate everyone that have been coming to these Bible studies and uh, I love the people of God and I miss being together with the brethren and I know the Lord will get us back together in his time. God knows exactly what he's doing. He's in charge, saints. Don't ever get to thinking man's in charge of this thing. What's going on in this world? God's in charge. Man may do their thing, but God's the one that's got the reins and he's the one that he sees to it that it goes his way. Hallelujah. God bless your hearts. I love all of you, you saints uh, in Little Rock. I'll see you Sunday morning, Bible study. Well, we have a continental breakfast at 10, 9, 7, 9.30. 10 o'clock Bible study. Band practice at quarter to 11 and uh, 11.30 service upstairs. I'm looking forward to it. God bless your hearts. Uh, pray for the... Uh, Missionary works. Pray for Brother Fide. He's online with us here tonight. He's over in Guatemala trying to plant the body of Christ over there. Pray for him, Brother uh, Brother Fide. And then Brother Elias Ciprian was on with us. I don't know who else was on from the Dominican Republic tonight. But pray for the Dominican Republic. I uh, had a call from a pastor today. This coronavirus thing is causing him to be in dire straits and he's in danger of, you know, having his home taken away from him because he can't get a job, he can't pay. And so pray for him, Brother Rudy. I'm, I'm praying for him. I'm asking God to help him develop, help him to, uh, to, he's a good, faithful worker in the body of Christ. And I want to see the Lord help him out of this situation. And I believe you will. Other works, uh, plenty of works in the Dominican Republic. Thank you, those of you that's mailed in offerings. We certainly do need them. We, we just can't meet all the needs that we have over there. I just hate it. Pastors call me with needs and sometimes I can help them and sometimes I have to tell them to wait a little while and maybe more money will come in. And uh, so pray for that. Brother Preval, they're having his funeral uh, tomorrow, I believe. Uh, no, tomorrow night. They're having it Saturday in uh, Pernalis in Haiti. I would, I would try to go to that funeral if it wasn't for this coronavirus. I just think it'd be a very dangerous thing to do at this point. Oh, there'll be plenty of people in his his churches that that uh, those brethren will be there, and God will help them. Uh, the work in the Philippines, Mexico, Brother Bud's work down in Mexico, uh, uh, and other places, the work over in, uh, in Cuba. We need to keep praying for Cuba. You know, God's establishing something over there. We've got people, Brother uh, Williams over in the Puerto Rico now. Uh, we've got that church we're working with. And then we've got some people in Chile that is wanting us to come to Chile. I've, I, I pray God would send me some help, somebody that really has a desire that would have a burden. Uh, I'm getting to be old and I won't be here forever. Uh, I'd like to have some men that would, I'd like to have some Timothys and Tyluses and Siluses to carry on the work of God. I'm not planning on going anywhere soon, but 
you know, I ha I can't deny the fact that I'm in my 70s, so I can't I can't think I'm gonna be here forever. Pray for me, and I'll pray for you. Hi, Sister Tansy. God bless you, and Sister Layton. All right. God bless. I love all of you. Have a good evening. Bye-bye.